Hi everyone, welcome back to Starlabs Confidential. Today we're going to be celebrating the 30th anniversary of Batman the Animated Series. And for today's guest is one of the show's most famous directors, Dan Reba. Thank you for being on the show, Dan. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to finally do this after, after uh, so long. So I guess to start off, how did you manage to get started to work with Bruce Timm in the, the DCAU? Well, w when when we started, there was no DCAU. Uh, that was just Bruce and Eric uh, getting a, getting a first shot at trying to get, do a Batman cartoon. I was working in the industry for like nine years before the show had started, and I had worked with uh, Kevin uh, at, at Deke uh, before that, and uh, for for many years on Ghostbusters and Starcom and 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 a, a, a ton of shows, uh, kid video and stuff. And, um, and Bruce actually was there for a short while on, uh, on a Beanie and Cecil show. And I saw that this guy was just amazing talent. And I, I actually, um, while I was directing on ALF, I remember I would take some time out to actually look at him draw his boards because they were so amazing. And just to see the process, um, it, was, it was incredible. And, um, but, uh, but then there was a, a year after Deke, I was working on this uh, project, uh, Little Nemo in Slumberland, that never, uh, it was a TV version of the movie, and it never sold. But, uh, but while I was working on that, um, I got a call from Kevin that he, uh, was, he had just gotten hired on a, on a new Batman show. And the promo that Bruce and Eric had done, I'm sure you've seen the promo, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Definitely. Yeah, that promo had been circulating around the industry. So I already knew about the show and I, I, I wanted so desperately to work on that thing. So when I got the call from Kevin, it was like, come on, this is gonna be fun, come on in, uh, come on. And so, so he set up the interview with, with, with Bruce and, um, and I, I brought in my portfolio and, and, and sketchbooks and, and the model sheets of stuff that I'd done for, for Nemo. And um, so I, I, I had been directing a Deke a little bit, but I decided not to go in as a director because I was getting my, my I was getting married soon, and I just, I knew I knew the kind of involvement and commitment directing is, and I knew I would have you know no time on the side, no life uh, if I was directing. So I I, uh, I opted to like storyboard or something else, and um, so I didn't even put myself out as a director on the show. I, I anticipated, I thought I was going to be a storyboard artist, but Bruce was like, I need models now. I need models. So you're, you're my character designer. Because he, at that point, he'd only had some layout guys that he had hired helping with models, but they weren't really getting it. And, and so, um, so that was, that was my start. And I, you know, he hired me, uh, fairly quickly and we got started in January of, uh, 90, yeah, 91. That's it. Yeah, it was January of '91, and um, and so uh, and then so that was uh, uh, that, that was how I started. So, how much input did you have in terms of like when creating like with the um, the episodes, or even like with the ideas for any other shows to be connected after ba Batman? Well, well, let's see. Like right from the get go, you know, Bruce is really great for for allowing input. Like I, I, I as a character designer. Um, I was helping with Man Bad, and, and he was having a tough time trying to figure out how to make it a monster. And I was helping him with that, even though he had like brilliant comic book artists helping. It just wasn't quite what he was, he wasn't quite getting it. And I, I helped a lot, but I came up with the idea of having the wings be part of his, his hands be, be part of the wings. Because in the comics, they came out of the wrist. And that really bothered me. So I, I drew that up and he liked that idea. And even though the, the design we came up with wasn't quite it yet, when Mike Kim was hired, he kind of nailed it right off the bat, but he incorporated the wing suggestions that I had. So that was kind of cool. Like right off the bat, I said, you know, I want this and can we do this? And he said, yeah, let's do that. And so it was done. Uh, in terms of my episodes, my first script, it was uh, Blind as a Bat was the one that I'd gotten uh, as the first directing on my own. And there was a problem for me in that uh, Bruce Wayne in that one, he, it was kind of a takeoff on Blue Thunder where, where there was a helicopter that's like this powerful helicopter. And in this case, it's, it's stolen and it's being used for evil by the Penguin. It was designed by Wayne Tech. And originally it was gonna be set up for the police. It was gonna be a police vehicle, but then we had the LA riots. So they changed it to a military vehicle. It kind of bothered me that 
Bruce Wayne was designing weapons because I didn't think of him as Tony Stark. I thought of Bruce Wayne as being a philanthropist and yeah. you know, I, I never really I don't really like the idea of Wayne Tech getting involved in weapons. That that wasn't really a guy, you know, he's against guns and this thing is loaded with guns. That just seems anti Bruce Wayne to me. Now that's you know, with the Kevin Nolan films that's like all that that's now <laughs> canon. That's part of what he is, but I, it wasn't when I grew up, the, the Batman that I knew hated guns. So I objected and, and Alan Burnett was like, oh, that's a good point. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so um, you know, it wasn't like I, I wanted to trash the show or anything. I just, I just felt like I kind of want to, like, I had my input. And Alan listened to me and put some lines in there um about having misgivings about about doing this and um and so at least i felt my voice was heard in my very first script um so i was kind of that was kind of cool yeah that's the first thing that comes to mind with that episode because like i always remember remember that line with his misgivings about going with weapons development yeah that was me it wouldn't have been in, it been there it had been you know someone else doing the show but i had them at that that was kind of cool yeah, plus it makes me think of that uh, little excerpt in World's Finest when Wayne and, and Luther were having a business partnership with developing like uh, robots, but then when Luther thought that, let's make him into weapons and sell him to the government, Bruce was like, nah, not going for, for it. That's right, that's right. So, so okay, well, cool. That is something that, that's been done in the films. All right, good, good. Because it always felt, it felt weird to me that he was designing all of his bad stuff and some of it is like clearly weapon oriented because he's, you know, and he's, you know, I don't know. Just I never thought that that Wayne Tech, you know, that, that Bruce Wayne was sort of was Tony Stark. It had never entered into it, you know. That was that's the whole Iron Man thing, you know. I guess you could say it's just it's probably because of the Dark Knight Returns for how like with his Batmobile it has the whole rubber bullets thing. I guess like with directors like Zack Snyder, they just t take it to like a higher level, like you know. Maybe it could be rubber bullets, but it hasn't been stated. So for all we know, yeah, he's probably is ki was killing people in that film. It, it, it just it it sure feels like it. That's that's the thing. It's like whether or not they are or not. It, 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 if it feels like he's killing people, it, it just I don't know. It, it bothers me. Yeah, that's like for me. I think the best like crossover with Batman and Superman is probably with World's World's Finest. You know, it, it's. It's simple, cre creative, and and very very unique with the two characters. Where it's just a team up, along with face up against mostly Joker. I mean, there was a little bit of an alliance with him and Luthor, but that got that got ended. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that, that it is that is really cool, and that was uh, and that was kind of neat because because Alan uh, came up with that storyline and, and and the idea of Bruce Wayne and Lois Lane hooking up which was really neat that that was very clever because there is like a hint of it in the first comic where they meet that that lois seems to be attracted to bruce wayne when they're on a cruise ship but they never it, i don't think they actually ever went there and had had them date and and this was kind of cool also because dana delaney was our lois lane but she was also andrea beaumont so it was a reunion of sorts between Kevin Conroy and Dana Delaney. Yeah, because when I see some of those scenes, it, I often imagine like, what would it be like if Harley Quinn was in Mask of the Phantasm when it came to the, all that conflict between Andrea and the Joker? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that would have that would have had added something or, or or changed something. I don't know if it would have worked as well. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I love Harley, but I, I you know. I don't know. Sometimes it's like Batman being alone and a, and a loner and not having Robin sometimes is cooler. Um, so, you know, although I love Lauren Lester, I love our Robin, I love our Nightwing. Um, but, you know, sometimes you just kind of feel like Batman works really well alone, too. Yeah, that's what's great for you guys. Like when you came back with uh, new Batman Adventures, you managed to uh, transition for Robin to being Nightwing. I think that's the first time that version of the character was ever brought to the screen. Yeah, I think so. I think so. We wanted to make him as cool as possible and, you know, he was going to be a badass, you know? He was, he was going to be tough and, and, and really cool. Especially with his own theme, his own batterings, or I'm not sure what he calls them, but... Well, we were modeling him off, off of uh, Bruce Lee a little bit. Because you know, when I watched The Green Hornet as a kid, 
you know, I watched it for Cato. I, I really, it was for me, it was the Cato show. I wanted to see him kick down doors, throw his darts, you know, and, and just like, he was just, he was so awesome. Um, so, so in this case, it was sort of like, yeah, let's, let's make him that awesome. Let's make, let's make Nightwing so like really, really cool. That's for sure. And I like that with Hi Guys, Hi Castle, like for certain actors to portray whoever in Batman the Animated Series, they got to lead to more famous characters later on, like one of the sideshow freaks in um, one of the later Killer Croc episodes, then lead on to becoming Lobo later on for Superman. Oh, he was awesome. He was he was awesome. Oh, Brad Garrett it was was like Brad so Garrett. much fun. He was so much fun. Uh, he he was a blast at the records. He was because he's that's like this natural comedian. So uh, and he, he he also played Bibbo. So he, we had him on the cast already, although it was just like a little incidental character. He didn't, you know, speak a whole lot. So, um, you know, when we were casting Lobo, it was like, wow, we got we got our Lobo right here. It's, you know, Brad's awesome. Yeah, it's just hard to believe. Like that's the same guy that plays that played Robert on Everybody Loves Raymond. I know, right? It was, you know, it was cool. It, he was he was awesome. You know, and and it's funny because it's one of those things where. Uh, the show, you know, he got very busy with Raymond and then won an Emmy and, you know, and stuff. So it was kind of harder to cast him for stuff um, because it's like agents don't really like cartoons, you know, but but he had a relationship with Andrea going back way before Raymond. He was he was doing stuff for uh, the Mighty Ducks for her before before the, the, the DCAU. So, you know, they know each other for a while. And, and we tried to recast Lobo. Um, but it was tough, and, and he actually came in and, and, and did the record and ADR as a favor. So it was, it was very, very nice of him because we tried, we tried to recast, but it wasn't working, you know. <laughs> so it was like, so yeah, I, I can't really think of anyone else that could that could have done that that voice well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they they found people eventually because I don't think they used him in the movies, and then they when they brought him back and doing other stuff, but but. Um, but for Justice League, he did he did actually come back and do and, and do it for us. So that was nice. Oh yeah, I, that that was definitely another great callback with him back. I, it, that was a fun show. That was that was that was that was that was fun working with him. So I guess out of the shows that you, you've directed, like uh, which would say was was your favorite favorite to work to work on? Yeah, and that's an interesting way of phrasing it because there are episodes that came out great that I love, and and so you always have something that's like. When people go, what's your favorite episode of the old series? Or, you know, and I kind of go Baby Doll probably because I think it's it's one of the ones that it's sort of outside of the box. It's a very weird show and and it and it, it, it just resonates with people in a weird way. And it's it's and it combine it combines like sort of comedic elements, but it's really tragic and it's it's, it's dark in its own way. Um, so I, I, I really have an affection for that show, but it may not have been the most you know, I mean, it was fun, but it wasn't like the the favorite experience working on a show. It's tough because there's so many. Like the, the Captain Marvel show, Clash on Justice League, was a dream come true. I love that character. The the Creeper uh, episode was one of my favorites because I love the, the Ditko comic, and I love you know I just love Steve Ditko's work. And we actually like pulled panels from the comics and his posing and all the leaping and stuff that he would do for. For various characters, we sort of adopted for for the creeper, and then and then of course the legends episode, where with the Dick Sprang and the Frank Miller stuff, it was it, it, it was amazing. That was that was actually like one of the high points. You know, that was really really an outstanding episode. But I have to say that I think the most fun that I had uh, during a show was uh, a Justice League episode, the the Great Brain Robbery, because the record was so much fun. We just it, we just laughed and laughed and laughed. Uh, that was that was uh, amazing. And if you look at the uh, the Michael Rosenbaum interview, he has this, his podcast and and his podcast where he interviews Clancy Brown. They both talk about how much fun that was. So I was I was you know it was gratifying because it's like yeah I, exactly that was the blast. I, I thought it wasn't just me. They both had a lot of fun on that and they still remember it um, mm -hmm. because playing each other's roles you know at some point somebody realized you know while we're doing the show it's like oh my gosh we have Michael Rosenbaum as our Flash and we'd cast him first before he was Lex and so here he was Lex Luthor in Smallville and, and we never acknowledged this we never we never 
you know, did any kind of thing with that. And it's like, before we're done, we're, we're going to regret not referencing his Lex Luthor. So we found a way to have him play Lex on our show by by having him switch brains with with, with Lex and and it was it was really it was really fun and the, how they did it too that was we decided to have each actor you know play the other role basically um, because they're in the bodies so their voices wouldn't change um, so what we did was had Clancy read his lines as Lex and then Michael Rosenbaum would do an impersonation. So every line, it, the record took a long time because everything was recorded twice, essentially, where we had the lead in re read and then the imitation read by the actor who was playing the role. And, okay. and they kept they kept topping each other and trying to read like really weird and really like extreme. And and it was it, they, it was just we just laughed and laughed and laughed. It was the funniest thing ever. Oh, I couldn't imagine the bloopers with that one. Oh gosh, I, I wish I don't know if we recorded all of the lines, of the lead-in, you know, lines, and and then then you know because they edit down to sort of like a you know to 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 to, to make like a radio play for for animation. Um, I don't know if any of that stuff survived, you know, because it, the, the editors have to they have to like the sound editors have to cut it all down. So I don't know if yeah. we, anyone uh, you know, but boy, we had a good time. Um, so that that was a that was a blast. Oh, the mix is Pitlick for Superman. That was a dream. That was it, you know. And I, I, my own regret is never working directly with with Gilbert in the room. He was he was recorded in New York, so uh, I didn't actually get to meet him. But um, um, but he was wonderful. He was wonderful. That was so much fun. Yeah, that he was one of my favorites. It's like imagining like if Iago had like the genie's powers from Aladdin. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, he, he totally nailed it. it. It's like I can't picture anyone else playing Mixia's Pitlick, you know. And uh, it was it was wonderful. It was yeah. so much fun. Yeah, I recently watched the episode. It's such it's just funny seeing a, a very comedic episode like that, and then you stumble onto an episode like with the late Mr. Ken, Mr. Kent, and it's which it's is like, like the, the darkest one that we've we've ever done. That was that was amazing. That was it was a great episode. Stan Berkowitz is a brilliant writer really dark stuff but it was fun uh, yeah that's for sure and with the great brain robbery i liked how it's like it involves with the brain switching but also like you know reference to the great train robbery <laughs> uh -huh, exactly the very first film made so the yeah. very first narrative so yeah it was, it was quite a callback i mean i love like all the little challenges back on 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 batman like coming up with effects and Superman and stuff like that. There are all these little cool things that, you know, but but in terms, you know, there are challenges and fun things to kind of, you know, figure out. But um, but in terms of, you know, how much fun to work on something, that was that was probably it. I don't know if it got much more fun than, than that one. <laughs> um, so. Oh, yeah, I, I imagine so. It's, it's, it's amazing how, like, Michael Rosenbaum, he's able to balance the time between doing the voiceover for, for Justice League as well as you know, going to portray Le Lex in Smallville. Yeah, I know. I know. It's amazing. And, you know, it, it's funny because, yeah, we did have to phone patch him a lot, but he actually would come down for records a lot of the time. I uh, you know he, he was, I don't, I don't remember him being absent a lot when, when Smallville started. So that's, I don't know how that, how that worked out. I mean, I guess I'm, I'm remembering most of the records we did like during their off season or something. But but we you know we managed to get him. Whereas um, after 9/11, Kevin Conroy moved back to New York, and uh, he uh, so he he was phone patched for quite a bit of of, of the show at, at, at that point. Um, oh, I see. Okay. So um, but then he he came back from time to time also. He wasn't always gone, but but we did a lot of you know a lot of the show you know, and it's just like pre-pandemic, so we were. You know, this this thing that we're doing, the zooming and the skyping and all of that stuff was still, you know, relatively new. Um, we didn't, you know, it was just a voice over over the phones that that they, you know, that they would do. And it, and, and even that, even that, it's like we couldn't use the, the an actual like over the phone recording. It wasn't because the, the sound quality wasn't up to snuff. 
the the phones weren't weren't clear enough to actually like have you know the speakers the mics on there on there weren't good enough to actually like create the quality you know so they'd have to go to an engineering room and we would direct over you know over the phone but they would send the tapes later so that we could cut them in um so it was always professionally done it wasn't like you could just like like we're doing now and that that was that quality wasn't there yet at that time so wow that's quite a process yeah but because like nowadays for most voice actors they don't need to they'll need to go to booth if they got like a a good set with the microphone stuff and uh if they have like a room where they can handle you don't have to worry about with the acoustics and stuff then it's all set just send them over and yeah i mean you, you we've got and, and the, the quality of the cell phones nowadays you know you, you have really good mics that they might be good enough you know if, if you clean it up and and do all the adjustments you might actually be able to do it off of a phone recording um but you know we couldn't risk that then there was no way that that was gonna be be, be good enough so you said like before, like you were you were also charged with ha- handling with the care designing. Was, um, what would you say was like your favorite um, care designs that they come up come up came up with? I was one of these guys that you know Bruce was doing the main characters. I kind of just did like the turnarounds to help facilitate stuff, or or you know put a hat on the penguin. You know, oh I put the you know. Uh, I did turnarounds for things that, you know, he would like do the main characters and then you kind of like, you know, but I, you know, I, so I did like security guards. I did the, the, the first, uh, the pilot that's he's Batman for the first time, the blimp pilots. It, it was a lot of that. It was a lot of helping facilitate. So I don't have like, a, oh, this is the character that I did this guy. You know, it's like, well, you know, it's like, oh, that lab guy there and this guy there and these crowd people. And, you know, I, I did, you know, I, I didn't have, you know, because because it was Bruce's show and he was kind of like, you know, doing the, the heavy lifting on, 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 on the on the look and the designs and stuff. You do a face. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was like I did like guest art type things, too. It's like the, the doctor at Arkham, like I designed him based on the actor, stuff like that, you know. Okay. Um, so it wasn't like. I, I didn't like, oh, I did Clayface. No, actually, I didn't do Clayface. You know, I did, I did, you know, I didn't, no, I didn't really. But I did help doing the transformations that, that they did at the end of that episode where he's transforming into all the different, all the different characters that he turns into and all that stuff. I, I, I helped design all that stuff. But TMS animated all of that stuff amazingly well. You know, it was it was incredible that thing at the end of the episode where he's yeah. like morphing. It, that that was that was extraordinary. So yeah, to me, like that's like peak level animation for Clayface. Like I don't think nothing can top could top that. No, for Clayface. Either. I mean, the closest like maybe would be from the Batman. Maybe when they had. Had like the first clay face because it some of the shape shifting was unique, but I don't know what TMS di- did for with feet of clay like that was like amazing. Yeah, it really was. It, it, it was it was the peak. That was amazing. So I'm not sure if you get this question a lot, but when it comes to shows, I guess like with with Superman or even with Batman Beyond, like um, was there ever gonna be like more with them before they? where they ended like were there any other like unscripted like episodes or plot lines that might have been followed with that got cut well you know uh honestly i don't know because i i wasn't in the writer's room for a lot of that uh i only know that that there was a batman show the script that got killed um because just they decided it wasn't workable um and and so that got killed and that became the see no evil episode i directed um and so that was that was, that worked out well for me because i kind of like the invisible man show better you know that that was that was a challenge that was fun but uh all, all i can i know for sure that nocturna bruce wanted to do the vampire you know nocturna and they the the network at that time this is pre-buffy the vampires weren't in and and uh there was no way that bsp were gonna was gonna allow that and it, it, it it's too bad because a few years later I, i'm sure they would have you know i'm sure they would have let us do that and then the batman ended up doing a batman meets dracula episode so they were like well 
that whole or, or you know movie so it's like obviously nobody cares about vampires now you know but back <laughs> in the day when when we were on fox and and, and the early days of the wb they, they they weren't they weren't gonna let us do that so i see i just after looking back with how superman ended i just felt like it would have been interesting to see what he had to go through to regain, I guess, like the public's trust again. Because I feel like when I watch Justice League, by the time we get to Dark Side, I feel like in the first season, nothing happened. Like, he never like lost his reputation or anything. It just well, felt like... there, there is, there is that. I'm sorry. I, I, you, I thought you were talking about specific episodes or something. In general, yeah, Superman was cut short. Um, we, we had planned, you know that we had planned a season of of superman regaining trust but then as as we got close to the apocalypse we knew that that was going to be the end at, at that for that for now so so that was when when you know bruce had that kiss on the top of the daily planet so that superman and lois actually have a relationship at that point you know but then it was a flirtation but now it's like we can see okay this the trajectory here you can imagine this the show is going to change at mm -hmm. this point um but but yeah they what happened was that the uh, we were on the kids wb on on, on on superman and and the ratings were good but but fox stopped running the batman uh the animated series and and the rights the way the contracts are written if you don't air them at a certain point in time the rights go back to to warner brothers so they were like we got batman back and we weren't done with our 65 run of, of Superman that we were going to do. And they were like, no, no, we want you to do these now. And they were like, but, but we're, we spent all this time figuring out how to do Superman and we haven't really gotten, you know, all the episodes yet. And they were like, no, 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 we got to get started on, 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 on Batman again. So, so that was, it was, it was cool because we were like, oh, okay, well, we get to do stuff we didn't get to do on Batman. And, and then at that point it was decided not to do the same show that we did on Fox. Let's, let's, let's do the things that we learned working with TMS on Superman. Um, we found the strengths in the animation uh, in the simplicity of, of things, um, that more streamlined approach to doing things because they were animated better by most of the studios when, when, when we did that. So, so we, we pulled it, you know, uh, into that new direction it, it, it was cool it was it was fun um i know some people balk at the how streamlined the new designs are but i i, I kind of i like them i think they were really cool i they're, they're pretty neat i just wish the joker had red lips but other than that yeah it's just like when i look at that design i feel like i'm looking at like the fourth warner sibling yeah <laughs> yeah well it, 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 the thing is that that there were some images of of the Joker uh, in in comics that Bruce was doing, and some shots and long shots that you know when he just did those those eyes glinting in the darkness, and they were, it's really terrifying. It, it was really really scary. But when you see that all the time, and you know he's not stepping out of shadows or something, it it, it doesn't quite read the same way as as it did in those few still drawings. So uh, it was an interesting experiment, but you know, I'm, glad, I'm glad we reverted back you know, when we brought it back in the Justice League and, 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 and Return of the Joker. Yeah, when I first saw that with the whole like red eyes, like just like gleaming like in the shadows, like that terrified me as a kid that I would, I would watch the movie, but then I would like hide like the tape somewhere. So I wanted to stare, stare at, at those like uh, the green face and gleaming eyes on the cover. <laughs> yeah, right? It's, it's it's pretty scary you know and and so yeah and and, and the, the good thing was they let us do more superman episodes and had them interact a few times so we were able to bounce between the two superman and batman um and that was that was that was fun i, I enjoyed that um and then uh yeah batman beyond we probably could have done more of those too um but at that point the there was a, a regime change at the kids wb and they were a little more hostile to us uh, Pokemon had taken off and was their huge big success so they wanted everything to sort of reflect uh, a Pokemon sensibility and this whole action adventure thing was not that network wanted at that point. Um, in fact as it was they, when they pulled the plug on Batman and Superman they were like oh we want to team Batman and we were like what? 
but yeah, it, everything had to be teenagers and cute. For, you know, kids don't relate to these characters, blah, blah, blah. But the toys were selling, the shows were doing well. They just they just wanted to like, you know, push, push, push the, 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 the young people angle. That was somebody got that bug up their butt that, that kids wanted to see other kids on TV. <laughs> And, and the funny thing was that eventually it came down, um, they finally focus tested and, and, and listened to kids who said that they didn't want to see uh, more school <laughs> on Saturday mornings. Um, that, that they, you know, it's like, um, and so, so that, that's finally things kind of changed after that. But fortunately, what they wanted to do was essentially Gotham, which would have made more sense as a live action show, and it did. But when they said, you know, we want to do a, an, an adventure show of, of a young teen Bruce Wayne going around the world, learning how to become Batman. And so we're like, so you want a Batman show without Batman? That's insane. We, we, that, that, that as a cartoon, that would never work. It doesn't make any sense. And, and so, you know, Bruce was the one who said, well, if you want a teen Batman, what if, what if it's in the future? What if it's another person? Then Bruce Wayne is there as a mentor. And they were like, hmm, oh, okay, we could do that. And and then when he drew a drawing of Bruce Wayne, that's when the crew got excited. Because at first they were like, ah, oh, Team Batman, Team Batman, oh, that seems lame, that's lame. But then he's like, and he looks like this. And we're like, oh, that design's pretty cool. That's a neat Batman. All right, I maybe. And then he said, and Bruce Wayne looks like this. And he did a drawing of like this really gnarly old, he had one eye and he was like, ah. And it was really scary and cool, like this old Boris Karloff looking Bruce Wayne and we freaking went nuts. And we're like, yes, this is it. That's the show we all want to. And the crew got excited by it and got really, it was really fun. And then of course the network pulled back, or, you know, the studio Warner's was like, he can't look that ugly. He, <laughs> he's, still, he's still Bruce Wayne, he's still Batman. He can't, he can't be that ugly. So we had to kind of pull back on, 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 on the one eye thing and the scars, um, but uh, but we still made him a, a grizzled old old guy, so it was cool. Yeah, though I'm glad you guys managed to bring that design in for the um, epilogue episode. We did, we did. It was it was cool to bring that back. That, and that was one of the things that you know had the movie taken off, but then again the the network kind of torpedoed the Return of the Joker. Um, they they did everything possible so that it wouldn't succeed. Uh, there wasn't a second Batman Beyond movie. There probably there would have been more um, had that one been been a huge success. But we saw the writing on the wall for Kids WB and Batman Beyond at at that point when Return of the Joker was 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 made. Could, yeah, we could have done more, but it ended. Oh well. <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing with Cartoon Network, it, there was not much of a problem in terms of. Um what direction you guys wanted to go and they wouldn't like you know be worried about with the uh, censorship and, and stuff as much there were still they were still a, a a few you know language and blood and stuff like that but not nearly as bad as it was at fox or 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 uh, or, or later at kids wb in the beginning of kids wb they didn't know they, they didn't really know what they were doing when it comes to bsmp they they really you know so they let us get away with a lot in the early Superman shows. Uh, I don't think I don't think the late Mr. Kent would have been done by the later group at uh, at, at, at Kids mm -hmm. WB. No, probably I, not. I, I don't think so. I don't think so. No. Yeah, or, or even the Over the Edge, because I looking yes. back, I feel like how did they manage not to like try to see out? No, you can't make that episode. Like, like because I feel like they would probably would have shoehorned in, even if in the end it was just a dream. Well, I mean, it was. <laughs> what do you mean? They did shoehorn that in. I mean, that was it, the whole point of that episode was that it was a dream. But, um, but I think that that they wouldn't have let kids know. I mean, that it wasn't a dream, or you know, that it was a dream. They would have made kids know right on the right, right from the onset. You know, I don't think that this idea of like, oh, you know, the revelation that it that it didn't happen, they wouldn't have let that go through you know they, they would have they would have forced us to tell them you know oh you can't just let people think that bad girl died but what was funny about that one was that that was a tms show and and they did the storyboards for it and bruce was going through the board and the original way that the the thing was drawn where the where bad girl lands on the hood of the car 
was done from the outside of the car. It's like they're driving along, and then, bam! The car, you know, you you see it, and it's it, and it's it's really brutal and violent and horrifying. And Alan kind of objected. He's like, you know, this is, yeah, we don't have censorship here on the show. <laughs> Nobody's telling us not to do stuff, but still, this is really a brutal thing. Um, can can we tone this down somehow? And so Bruce thought, okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll obscure it by having the point of view being in the car. So you're not going to see the impact directly on the on the hood, but you're going to see it through the glass. And 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 of course, when you see the episode, it's a thousand times worse because Commissioner Gordon is driving the car. And and so a it's the shock of. In fact, I'm pretty sure there's a whole lot of car accident like like insurance ads and things like that where you see the impact from the inside of the car and I don't remember seeing a whole lot of that before before that episode. I think that episode really impacted people because I think it's being it, it's inspired a lot of things um, because that whole idea of being in the car and all of a sudden bam the windshield shatters and 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 you know she hits the car it, it's so startling and, and shocking um, and brutal in a way that that just like seeing it happen from the outside would have been horrible but but not nearly as impactful yeah it's, it's just crazy because like I've seen like other shots when it comes to like um, sort of portraying like deaths and stuff like there might be like a cutaway like where like when Joker would like harshly like hit hit Harley you would see like Bruce like you know squinting squinting his eyes like not not looking at but you hear the impact i figure it'd be something like that for batgirl but no you see like the impact i mean whether it's from the outside or inside it's like right right wow. i mean it is it it is obscured you know you do have a windshield and a hood and and you don't actually like you know but you see her body come down you see the car shaking you know it, it's 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 just your brain like makes it a thousand times worse so it's it was uh, it was brilliant storytelling. I, I just I, that was that was a great episode. Yeah, and that was one of those things that came down after after Paul had told Bruce that he wasn't you know the, or the Bruce had told Paul that he didn't want any more dream episodes because we did too many dreams in the old series and he's like I don't want any shows where stuff isn't real and it isn't happening. And then he came up with that one and was like, all right, all right, we'll do that one. <laughs> but no more after this. <laughs> so. Yeah, because I mean, it could. It's a. It's sort of, I guess, a callback to when, like, I guess, Casella when Batgirl's run originally ended in the comics, and just instead of being Oracle, just like you know, yeah, potentially being killed. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, but I mean, how many dreams episodes were, were there? I mean, there was, there was Mad Hatter. That's the obvious one. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think. I guess one of the Scarecrow ones, like the earlier ones, like with um, Dreams in Darkness, I guess that's... Right. I guess that yeah, count. Yeah, although. yeah. There weren't that many, actually, but but Bruce wanted to keep the show real, you know, and, and, and not make it more, you know, a dream show, which is also kind of like got in the way uh, with Neil Gaiman when he wanted to do a Sandman, uh, or not, he, you know, when Paul had suggested, and Neil was like totally on board. He, he was like, yeah, let's do a Batman-Sandman crossover. Yeah, that would have been interesting, especially after seeing the the Sandman show right now on Netflix. Right, right. It would have been so cool, and um, that was killed. We we didn't we didn't before we even got there. It was like no, 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 no more dreams. We're not doing that. So <laughs> so it's like all right. And then when we were doing Justice League, we couldn't have done stuff anyway because there was an edict from DC that all the deals we we could do every character pretty much except for Vertigo. So anything in the vertical realm, we, we weren't allowed to touch um, because they had a different contract with the creators at that point. And that made me mad because at that point, Swamp Thing had been a, a vertical character, but it didn't start out that way. It, and they, they had appropriated Swamp Thing, but it was like, come on, you know, I wanted to do Swamp Thing so bad. And, and it bummed me out that, that Swamp Thing didn't get animated until much, much later. That, that's my one, my one disappointment. Uh, Plastic Man and Swamp Thing, I always wanted to do. Uh, and, and they didn't get animated until much later. So True. Yeah, I remember that one episode where he was least mentioned of being in the league, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there was the development for a Plastic Man series. That's why we weren't allowed to use him. But they let us at least reference his existence. Um, and that was a, 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 a sticky thing also, because 
the the joke was that elongated man could uh stay uh he could he could uh what is it that he could stay in the shape of an urn or something a vase for for you know an hour for 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 a few days and um and and then the uh, the response is oh you cannot um and and because he's he's uh, comparing himself to plastic man and and then we got a note from dc going well you know he only stretches he doesn't do the plastic man thing he doesn't turn into things and then so the the line was basically implying that he's lying that he doesn't do that uh-huh. so so it was okay you know it actually made a joke out of it so i was kind of glad we got that note because it actually made a made a joke out of his you know you know it made him a liar okay i guess it's good that he's not it doesn't have exactly the same powers as plastic no, man no he doesn't he he just stretches so that that's that's what he does still i mean i'm glad for swamp thing he did get added to be technically i guess in the batman and harley quinn movie yep yep for only all of two seconds yeah <laughs> and and but he showed up on on justice league action and he showed up in uh he showed up on other stuff i, I don't know if brave and bold did a swamp thing mm, don't think so no not swamp I think thing so. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know, but they, but I know he showed up in Justice League action. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's shown there as well as a couple of them and movies when they were doing the whole uh, Justice League Dark. Yes, theme song. yes, yeah, yeah, there he showed up. Yeah, you know, Swamp Thing was like a huge influence as a kid, and I, I see Bernie Wrights in the conventions, and so it would have been, it would have been really cool. But eh, you can't, you can't do everything. I got to do Captain Marvel. That was, that was my, my, my lifelong dream. So. So it was cool. Yeah, I I wish we could have seen more of Captain Marvel. Like like maybe just had to like rejoin the league or like maybe something like where maybe he and Superman kind of patch things up and maybe like you know Superman like helps him out or something. For some reason, and I don't know why, um, but DC was very clear that we only had one a one time use of the character, and so. I wanted to put him in a crowd scene in in that one episode with all the the, the alien spiders, you know, because we have like everybody in that group, you know, and um, and Bruce is like, you know what, we have a one time use, and if DC is really sticking to that, if we even see the character, we might lose an episode, we might lose him. So let's let's not let's not, you know. So they came up with the idea of him joining the group and leaving the group in one episode so that we wouldn't have to address his absence before and after because that was that was it. We only had one shot with him. And we really wanted the Superman and, and Captain Marvel to fight. We, we that was the whole that was the whole thing. It, it was so, sort of symbolic of the whole Superman lawsuit and Captain Marvel and back in the day. And <laughs> so we were just playing off of that. And the idea that, you know, he's more likable than Superman, um, because that's what happened in reality. The Captain Marvel books were so whimsical and so charming and so much fun, they outsold Superman like by a significant amount. If they had actually not sold as well and had been not as popular, I don't think DC would have pursued them. But for the first thing was that, you know, they made a movie after after uh, DC pulled the Superman serial from republic to make the cartoons um which are gorgeous and i love those things and those are huge inspiration um yeah you know that republic was like upset and they went well who else do we know we developed all this flying technique and all this you know effects and stuff let's like who else do we know who, who else can do this stuff that we can and they and they reached out to Fawcett and decided to do the captain marvel thing and and that was a great serial so dc was sort of like they were upset because their competition actually got got something licensed, and then if they had not sued the faucet, they, they'd still have been around. But what happened then, though, was that when they shut down Captain Marvel, most of the crew, except for CC Beck, went to DC. So Otto Binder, Kurt Schaffenberger, Al Plastino, like tons of people, tons of, of, of writers and artists went to DC, and they started incorporating the things that made Captain Marvel successful they started to put them into superman so Otto bender was writing really cool stories and you know things like mixie started showing up and supergirl was a mary marvel ripoff all of these things started to like ad- adapt and glom onto superman and superman started taking on you know captain marvel 
attributes and 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 that's when like the the weisinger the the, the late 50s and early 60s you know era of of of, of superman kind of like with really weird you know stories and really fun stuff that 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 was kind of where where it kind of revitalized superman and helped him you know stay uh, stay popular interesting i because I, I knew about with the whole like uh lawsuit and dc acquiring of faucet but that's it but i had no idea the reason was because of how captain marvel comics were were performing well, better sales at the time oh yeah at that point he was it was he was like two million sales you know two million and and it was it was huge still though i like to cat to marvel because like every kid's dream of like how what would be like to be a superhero and like mm -hmm. captain marvel has like the best superhero disguise ever like yeah. if any, any of his enemies want to try to find out who he is like unless they're like really observant no one's going to think of looking for a kid they're going right. to, to find, find like, like someone someone that's like you know abnormally tall and big i would say captain marvel's like the the real boy scout just because of right. the whole pure of heart thing yep that's that's it and it's i i it's it's really it was really fun it was it was a really fun episode to do and we actually like we even had superman hit him with a safe which he, which is directly taken from the the, the mad magazine wally wood uh, super duper man and then we started riffing off of the fight in uh kingdom come by having Captain Marvel use Shazam, the lightning as a weapon, having the lightning hitting Superman. That was a cool bit that we borrowed from, from Alex Ross. It, it was neat. We got to stay, and I, you know, and I actually like boarded some of the flying across uh, Fawcett City, and I made sure that the poses when he's saying Shazam were taken from the movie serial, because I, that was the, the thing. I, I love that serial. Um, I, I had it on Super 8 when I was a kid, so I, I, I love that thing. So, nice. so, so we're you know just drawing from everything. But you're only able to use them just once. Only, only once. once. Only once. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I guess they might have had plans to, but I guess make a movie because I think around 2007 they first casted Dwayne Johnson to play Black Adam. So I guess maybe they were trying to make something with that. Yeah, I think so. I think they they've been working on it for quite a while. Yeah, William Goldman wrote a script way back when, and you know and. Uh, the guy who wrote uh, Princess Bride, but but they, but they didn't like it. I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with it, you know. But oh well. Those are the same things happen like that because I think I remember like from with Batman Beyond, like supposedly with the Just League setup, like there was supposed to be a future Wonder Woman, but I think because of restrictions, you guys had to, had to bring in Big Barda instead, right? Yeah, yeah. I, that that's a thing. It, it's funny the way that DC works in terms of rights. When we were setting up Justice League, there was like negotiations for each of the characters. Um, it was like bringing on actors and trying to sign them up. And it, it was like the, the negotiations with DC over every character. It's like, okay, we got Batman and Superman and Slam Dunk. Those were easy. Okay, now, you know, let's, let's try to get the Flash. Okay, we got the Flash. Okay, we got you know martian manhunter and it, everything sort of like it was it was this progression of of like every every day every every week there'd be like more characters signed on but wonder woman was the last one and the negotiations with the marston estate it, it's not it's not like dc can just go yeah yeah just do this it, it you'll actually have to negotiate with the with the with the family with the rights owners and you know it's not just like DC calling all, all the shots and saying, you know, you know, there's all this sort of red tape behind the scenes that has to be worked out. That, that was kind of a hassle. Um, and it was scary because we weren't sure uh, for sure whether we could have her or not. And, and, and that was always like Big Barda was always sort of like the backup in case we couldn't get her. Because early on, in fact, when we first developed the Superman series, Bruce wasn't sure if he could make an interesting Superman show on its own and thought what well, from the get-go let's do superman and the justice league and do a rotating group every episode and have him to team up with different people but um and and at that point the roster was was still it was going to be john stewart 
but it was Green Arrow, uh, Black Canary, and I think it was Big Barda in that lineup. You know, I don't think it was going to be Wonder Woman because I don't think, you know, because even then I think, you know, rights issues and stuff like that. And, I think, and also like Mr. Miracle was was in the the, the Maguire, you know, versions of, of that, that, that the Keith Giffen uh, Justice League. So we were going to kind of like riff off of those characters a little bit too. Hmm. Um, and and uh, and DC uh, and Warner's both were like, no, no, Superman gets his own series. That can come later, but we have to reestablish, you know, Superman in animation. And um, and so that was that killed that, which is fine because we didn't have the technology back then, the, the computers and, and 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 stuff to really kind of help. Um, facilitate the animation um, and I think by the time Justice League came along it, it made things a lot easier for the animators to do this giant scale um, that we, we wouldn't have been able to pull that show off um, back in the early days it would have been way too expensive yeah it's crazy because like back then I feel like with DC like if it's not Batman or Superman involved in any way then it's like forget forget it yeah yeah there's that too and and it's it, it's funny you talk about episodes that that could have been you know the, the justice society i really wanted to do them uh but but that was one of those things where 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 dc wisely actually ultimately because i like the justice society uh, decided that you know because the the plot involved killing them off um and then they're you know they were like well this is a great story we love it but you can't we, we can't use our characters for this because we wouldn't want their only version in animation to be a dream version to be you know they're, they're already dead so that they came up with the idea of like well why don't you just do like what Alan Moore did with Watchmen and, and, and the Charlton characters why don't you just come up with your own versions and that was really fun to actually have that to like you know do our parallels of, of the Justice Society but um, it was a hassle to come up with names because DC was very adamant about not using names that sounded too much like uh, even descriptions. So we couldn't have like the Emerald Guardian or the Scarlet Speedster, any of those things that, that describe the Flash or, or Green Lantern. We had to like come up with new, new, new names. That So it was like, it, it was a tough one. And Catman, you know, was our Wildcat Batman sort of mashup thing. Mm-hmm. And um, and the fact that DC owned a Catman that was a villain worked, you know, even though there was a superhero Catman that was a, a different company. It's, it's, I think, in the public domain at this point. And, but just even that, DC was like, let's make sure that it's the Catman that we own. So when we see the tombstones, we actually named it, you know, the character that's the, the, the Catman, the, the, the villain version that DC owns. So that's, uh, it, they did that on purpose so that we would, you know, just in case there's any legal ramifications, um, they were like, no, no, this is the one we own. <laughs> so, Although I do remember there was an episode, I think, with, um, I think it was The Cult of the Cat, where there yes. was, yeah, I think there was like a version of yeah, Catman version. Just, just being like a cult leader. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So they, yeah, he, he was actually in, in um, I know, that was one of Butcher shows. This is a good one. But yeah, so we actually did have that character, but, you know, this is a different universe and all, so it's okay. You know, we can, it's, it's him from a different world. So, it's cool. Yeah. Plus, with Black Siren, the name was used in the um, Arrowverse years later. Yes, yes. Uh, not just that. I mean, it's the, it's the character. Um, and that was uh, the same writer. Andrew Kreisberg wrote that. I mean, he wrote our script, so... He, he liked that character, so he, 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 he appropriated her, even though we named her. Yeah. <laughs> so. You always like how the uh, the Arrowverse shows, they do like certain callbacks back to uh, Justice League or or even, or even like with um, Batman Beyond with some of the future lingos. Yes. Yes. Well, have they actually used Shway? Yeah, they actually used Shway when they brought in, um, I think it was like the Flash's daughter, no- Nora. That's right, they did. I, I, she does say Shui. That's right. I remember that. Yes. Yeah, I think their their son Bart Impulse, yes. like he would say, Crash from Young Justice. Oh, that's funny. Wow, it's all one big thing. It's all we're all we're all riffing off of each other. It's really fun. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it, it would be 
I think for Captain Marvel, it would have been great if there was something, because I've seen like some comic panels like of when Superman realizes who Captain Marvel is. He actually, I like this comic panel where he confronts the wizard, like with, with his decision, like, you know, why would you give a boy these powers and let, let him have this life? And then like Superman actually like consoles then Billy with, I guess, with some major event. So it's, I don't know, I feel like it'd be an interesting dynamic if Superman I, I is know. like a, a mentor to him. A exactly, exactly. What was brilliant about all that though was that was that we we were setting up something with with Superman and and this episode was sort of like you know Lex is poking him with his self doubts and so Captain Marvel was there just to sort of like be a catalyst. I know Superman's kind of a real jerk in this episode. He's completely played by Lex and um, oh yeah yeah I know some people object to that but it, I think it works because you know we get our fight and at the end of the episode you know Superman agrees with Captain Marvel you, you know he's like yeah you're right we've lost sight you know Dwayne's big thing about Superman was that his weakness his big weakness and and and, it, and that is a callback from the dark side brainwashing him episodes you know where uh, he his big weakness is his his fear of losing control. And so seeing Superman of, you know, the Justice Lord Superman killing Lex and, and taking over, you know, and, and, and being aware that he's able to do that and that he could do that if he loses sight of who he is, that's his fear. And, and also he kind of sets up the thing where in the first season of Justice League, he kind of gets taken out a lot early on because we were having trouble trying to figure out how to get him out of the way so the other characters could shine. Yeah. So, so <laughs> you know, we'd always have Superman kind of going in and 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 get taken out, and it became kind of too cliche. It was just became too obvious that we were doing that too much. You know, it just it was hard. It was a really hard show to stage and figure out how to how to make the character dynamic work, and and so that that tended to be this cliche that we were doing with the character. But Dwayne kind of even justified it by having him sort of complain about looking, you know, what it's like living in a world made out of cardboard and, and having to pull his punches and, and having to pull back. And, and, and so it, it, that's his fear is, is, is hurting people and killing people and, and losing control. And so when people will kind of needle him and, and, and work on his self doubts, um, it, 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 you know, it gets to him. Um, and, and that's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a really interesting dynamic. Um, that, that's, that's the stuff about Justice League, that that whole Cadmus arc and, and all of that stuff worked so well. Um, it was pretty powerful stuff. Definitely. I suppose it would be interesting to see, like, if there's more of, with Hugo Strain Strange, because I saw he was, like, part of, like, the, um, part, part of Cadmus, but then I think because of the whole that embargo, as fans would call it, yeah. he, had to, he had to be replaced with a different character. Right, right. It worked out okay. Um, but yeah, yeah, we had that bad embargo. I mean, it, it sucked. Cause, I mean, at least they let us use Alfred for the Thanagar episodes. But um, but yeah, you know, because we even had like, you know, because of Teen Titans, we couldn't really have Robin show up. And, you know, they, it, it was it, it was tricky. It was tricky. Um, so... I suppose, but I feel like, you know, between those three shows, they're, they're like very different animation styles. I feel like, you know, it's, I don't know, it's me, I feel like I, feel like I can I tell know. the difference. I know. I, and one, the one that hurt a lot to me was like, um, there were several actually embargoes that we had during the, during Justice League. So uh, it, 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 it ticks me off that, you know, like, oh, Justice League action, they can do it. Brave and Bold, they can do anything. You know, James seemed like rights to do the entire universe without any quibbles and we didn't have that on justice league they were always like oh you can't use vertigo and you can't use this character and then aquaman is uh we're, we're developing a series for him and we can't use any of his villains so black manta had to become uh devil ray which was actually a really cool thing um dave johnson came up with that name and we were like yes he designed the character and the name and we were like yeah that's it that's 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 better than black manta so devil ray is it yeah it's perfect they were developing a metal men show while we were doing our metamorpho so chemo which would have been a perfect i mean the whole thing is leading up to the creation of this big chemical creature you know and it was going to be chemo um and and they 
DC was like, no, Kimmel's like the only main villain for the for the Metal Men, and 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 we really, you know, and and we're developing that series, and so no Kimmel. So we had to come up with some kind of generic uh, Kirby-esque monster that, you know, <laughs> which was really fun actually, because it was it was actually kind of cool to do to do one of those big, you know, Kirby kaiju, you know, kind of thing. Um, but yeah. but it's still, you know, I have a sketch somewhere of a of a Kimmel that I had done, so it would have been kind of fun. Gotcha, because I know, I think there was a Kemo in like the first episode of uh, Justice like Unlimited, right? Uh, it was a little different. It was a little different, but yeah, there was a thing of that. Yeah, it was it was it was inspired by no, but it wasn't. It was something else. It was some other nuclear creature thing. I don't know if it was Kemo per se. It was uh. some radioactive thing that was it was reminiscent, but it wasn't the same thing. No, no, because this this they they really wouldn't let us use this. Wait a second. Oh, you're right. Maybe it was, but Justice League Unlimited was after Justice League, so yeah, they they probably got the rights after that. Yeah, it's been out. I'm thinking about it. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, we couldn't do it back then, though. That yeah. wasn't my episode, so that doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but still, this is crazy. It's, it's like you know, you guys here will still make your Batman series between Tim Burr and Joel Schumacher. Like, those movies didn't stop you guys from making making episodes. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. But at that point, that the way the rights worked and the way that they, they always felt like they were infringing on stuff because it's like, ah, it's different because Batman's like fair game and this rogues gallery, everybody knows the rogues gallery and, you know, these other characters are more obscure and people aren't, you know, they're not as familiar with the stuff. So when you do a cartoon, it may be the first time someone's going to be exposed and they want to make sure that, you know that doesn't infringe on on the licensing and the merchandising and and and, and the deal making because people will think oh has this been done before is this the first time we're seeing it we're, no it was done in a cartoon oh well that's not as new. now it's now it's used you know it's already been done so it, it, it there is a there is a logic to it to, to that to that embargo idea i get it it's just unfortunate that's true. I mean, because like at that point, by just like I mean, you guys have done all kinds of stories with Batman and his villains. Like, what more can there be? Like, I mean, I probably wouldn't have Joker be part of the secret society, but right, right. Like exactly. maybe, like maybe someone like Scarecrow or Riddler or I don't know. Yeah. Maybe just like at least appear, maybe just appear in the background or something. But right, right. No, it'd have been cool to have Catwoman come back and do stuff. I mean, I, that she was she's been a, a fairly underutilized character. You know. Yeah, because I feel like it'd be interesting if they, if there was a Hush movie, but like based within the DCAU sort of. I think that'd be interesting. That way, it'd be a nice reunion with all the actors and see something develop with with Catwoman, right. and, and maybe right, right, if right. she knows knows Bruce's secret. Well, what's interesting, by the way, and you talk about episodes that you know that didn't happen, whatever. Um, the the idea, the germ of the idea of epilogue actually started. Bruce and Glenn came up with the idea of of Terry being sort of a clone-ish, you know, character, a clone of of Bruce. But the catalyst in what was going to be a sequel to Return of the Joker was that uh, it was going to be uh, Selena Kyle that does it. Uh, she was going to be the one that said that uh, that originally she clones she clones Robin as well. And so there's like a Nightwing doing stuff, and but he's really young, and they can't really figure out what's going on with this, and that's it. And then, and then you find out that not only that, but but Terry is actually a clone of, of Bruce without his knowledge, and they kind of figured out how how that all worked out. And um, and when the Return of the Joker, you know, busted, they they uh, they dropped the idea of doing a, a, a sequel. But uh, and it would have been cool too, because. But fortunately, it didn't happen, and we were able to, you know, make the plot work better with Amanda Waller and, and Cadmus actually justifying how that it made much more sense as a story for us to have done it in, 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 uh, in Justice League. Yeah, and that was also supposed to be our last episode. Yeah, but you guys managed to get an, one more season to go. Yeah, yeah, and then we got the, the Legion of Doom in that one. That was just so sort of like let's just just have fun. But yeah, I would say Return of the Joker is probably like the biggest movie that you guys have done for the DCU because like you guys managed to create not only the beginning, but pretty much like the ending for like 
Batman Joker's last fight. Yep. I honestly, I think it's it's my favorite uh, of them. I, I love Mask of the Phantasm. I'm proud to be if, uh, associated with it. I think it's a, it's a lovely script, and I'm so glad that it was well received. And the, the idea that both Siskel and Ebert, you know, gave it thumbs up, and it, you know, it's everybody, you know, remembers it fondly. Um, that's great, and I and I, I appreciate that. But the animation is better in Return of the Joker. Um, it's an interesting story. It's it was it was really a fun. It was a fun thing. Um, I didn't direct or have anything to do with it, except that I got to sit at the record, um, the table read and the record to see sort of Mike Hamill's reaction to the script, which was really, really cool. It was really, really fun. Um, yeah, you must have had some real fun with that one. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was cool. That was, those are good times. So I guess besides Mark Hamill, like, uh, what, who are the favorite actors, like, uh, that you got to got to work with or at least see like in the in the recording booths um you know i mean it's it's like you've got your famous actors that are like you know ed asner was was a blast he was wonderful to work with i i you know oh my gosh that was that was a blessing he was just awesome and i got to work with him with freakazoid too so it, it he was just great um he was having so much fun as granny goodness he was he was phenomenal and i got to work with him you know uh, as daggett and and as Cosgrove on Freakazoid, and then to any goodness. So um, it was I, I I got to to, to work with him a few times, and he's he's just a delight. He was just so much fun. Um, Brad Garrett was a blast. He was always funny and 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 you know hilarious and fun to work with. And uh, Paul Williams uh, was the first celebrity, you know, I, my first record, and that at that point I was just too awestruck to, 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 to talk to him um, but uh, I love Phantom of the Paradise and I think he's a genius he was brilliant in that as well as you know that was the villain but the, the music was amazing so yeah I was in awe Roddy McDowell was amazing to work with and and of course you know Mark Hamill you know my gosh it's like it it it, it, it is just amazing and it's so weird to like think that you're you're working with with Luke Skywalker. It's like this. It's like it's so it's so cool. Um, so yeah, and then and then you know it's like Phil Lamar is is amazing. Susan Eisenberg is great. The the the, the whole cast of Justice League was was outstanding. They're all gems. They're all wonderful. You know. So I'm yeah. We're, and, and of course Kevin Conroy for crying out loud. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate Batman. You know. Diane Pershing is poison ivy. They're they're wonderful, you know. It's it's they like are. they're all really great. So yeah, my favorite, you know, I, there is no one favorite, you know. But but it's like but the one that maybe it's just sort of like you're so in awe of that you you know get to work with Mark Hamill. It's like yeah, of course, you know. That's you know how many times I saw Star Wars in the theaters and just to think of like, I'm working with this guy. That's amazing, you know. Yeah, it's amazing. Like even now, even nowadays, people are still like surprised to think like, like that that guy Luke Skywalker has done voices like the Joker. It's like, I don't believe it, but right. no, nah, well, it's him. Well, you know that's the thing where it's like uh, Clancy Brown is like that in a way that you don't even you see him in villains in so many movies, and he's also Buckley Banzai, he's Rawhide, and you know he's, he's like so versatile, but he's he's also like so dark and scary in so many movies. And he's also, you know, Mr. Krabs on SpongeBob, and, yeah. and and that's that's crazy, you know. To, you know, he's he's just he's so much fun, and and you wouldn't know it from Lex, you know, like he just seems so so dark and serious as Lex, but he's he's also a, a, a joy to work with, I, I, you know. And this is just a DC, you know, person, you know. I might work with a bunch of cool guys on on Ben 10 as well, so it's been pretty cool. Yeah, it's just amazing how what was started from just with Batman by itself, it just grew to like with creating like with all these other shows that became connected and really changed the landscape for Warner Bros. animations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's and it's funny because you know when we started out, there was no DCAU. Right? It's like this 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 is the show. You know, this was what we started. And and that was the idea, you know, we're just we're just doing this and the idea of this expanding into this universe of like, oh, then we'll do Superman and then we'll do this. And it was there was none of that. It was just like, let's just get this show done. 
And, and had we known that there would be a bigger DCAU, there were a lot of the rules that we had set up for Superman, or for Batman, that, that didn't apply to Superman because, you know, the, the, we wanted things to be like real world. There was, you know, no magic and, and the supernatural was going to be explained and everything was going to be science-based and, and sort of real world. But then when Superman came along, then we had like, you know, science fiction elements that, that and, and, and magical elements and stuff that we had to like, you know, because it's a bigger character and the world gets bigger. And then when we incorporated the two worlds, you know, then it's like, well, now now this stuff exists in, in Batman's world. And so, you know, things change. and. And, and we didn't really think in terms of continuity. Bruce wasn't really a big continuity fan, but as we was doing Justice League, we realized that, that continuity was kind of more important. And, and even as we were doing Superman, we were always thinking in terms of small scale continuity, you know, even in Batman to some degree, where we had uh, Harvey Dent be you know the, the DA for a while, and we would have had him go on longer, but then Alan Burnett came on the show and came up with a great plot for, for the Two-Face origin. And we were hurting for scripts, so we really needed to, to get it into rotation. But I, I, the intent was to have many more episodes of, of Harvey Dent as, the, as the, the DA before that happens. Fortunately, we had, you know, he was, he was, he was in the Poison Ivy episode as well as the, the Man Bad episode. And he's in a couple of others, you know, he's in a few before mm -hmm. he becomes Two-Face. But, you know, not nearly enough. I think I think the idea is like you really wanted to forge a good friendship between him and Bruce Wayne, and and, and you know, um, but it's okay. You know, the, the Two Face episodes are fantastic, so great. You know, it, it saved us. It saved us. You know, it changed the direction of the show. It made it. You know, it was really awesome. Yeah, and that's technically your your guys is I think first two parter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, and it, and it taught us things about being you know doing two parters where. We had one part go to one animation studio and another one go to another and one director and another. And after that, you know, the two episodes were so very different in quality and, and style and quality and animation that um, after that, the edict was made that, that we stagger uh, the, the episodes so that the same director does both parts. And if possible, stagger them in a way that the same animation studio does both parts, if that's possible, so that there's consistency because the two parts are really different in style and, and animation and quality and stuff. And, you know, it's it, it, it's really too bad about the Clayface. And, you know, the, the, the Two-Face thing is different. That was actually, Kevin did both parts of that. But it was also the animation quality is different on the second part. It's it's okay. It well, was fine. Yeah, with Feet of Clay, clay I mean, face, But the Feet of Clay was like, you know, it's very different. I guess, I mean, I was, I mean, I wouldn't think there was like too much of a difference. Just like, you know, besides with the shape shifting, I felt like it just like, quality was definitely better in the second part but like it wasn't so that's cool that, that's i'm glad that that you can't see it you know it's like <laughs> those of us that work on it we get really picky that's the other thing about it we, we're we're you know there was an episode of justice league that we almost threw back because the animation was terrible like 80 percent retake so we retook so much of the show and and it, it actually hurts for me to watch it because the second part was so good it was the, the wild west episode and that was one of those times where it was like, you know, one director did one and the other director did the other one because, you know, um, but it was fine because, I mean, the second part is so beautifully animated. It was so wonderful. The, the Batman Beyond, you know, thing, whereas, yeah. you know, when I did the Wild West one, it was like the, 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 the studio just just blew it. And, and yet with all the retakes and the music and the voice track, people don't really tell. You can't really tell that, that the animation is is weaker you know it, it's it's fine it it, it 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 plays fine but boy it, it was so disappointing it was so off model and poorly animated and the horses were wretched and they just it it was it was a mess and 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 it was so much of it was retaken um to be just sort of passable what really you know it never really got great but it was fine um and so you know you just nitpick when you when you're you know, when, when you're the one doing the show, you know. I suppose so. It's just, I, I guess, like the animation quality for like with that with those two episodes, like it was nothing really, really struck my eye as much. I mean, I mean, I'm not an animator, so, so. It's... Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. That's what happens. It's like <laughs> we get really picky about stuff, and I felt like that when I talked to James Tucker about 
uh, Brave and Bold because I thought they were, that was a magnificent show and wonderfully consistent throughout. And you know, I don't think there's a bad episode. And and they were like, you know, okay, if you think so, because <laughs> you know, because they work on it. You know what you intend, and you know what what they fell short on, and you don't really. You know, you 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 feel the flaws more than anyone else when when you're the one making it. Um, and but as an audience, you don't you don't get all the the nuance and the things that 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 didn't make it in. True. Yeah, because a friend of mine has mentioned something like when it comes to like with the st- with the movie, I guess when you try to balance between like with like the effects, the story, and the acting, sometimes you can't have all three. Sometimes I guess like um, right, some things has to give. Or something more and i say with the, with that two part with with chronos and everything i feel like with the story the characters and i guess the continuity of bringing like with batman beyond static shock and and with the other justice league members and even like with jonah hex like that's yeah. that's just crazy because like seeing a well a younger jonah hex that, yeah yeah exactly exactly no it was cool and that was a fun one too because i I actually collected Batlash comics when I was a kid. I loved the Bat- Batlash stories, and I loved it, uh, El Diablo. So Diablo and Batlash, and and um, you know, it, it was just it was so cool. Um, and we renamed Powell Smith because it was sort of like oh, a little offensive name. So you know, we gave him a name, you know, <laughs> and and we and we treated yeah. him with respect, you know, because it was sort of like. You know, but but we same character, you know. So it was he's it was cool bringing him in. And I like the Western version of the Justice League theme when they're it's all so cool. Out. That was so cool. It was like the Magnificent Seven. It was awesome. I I was I went to a convention with Susan Eisenberg recently, and and she was signing a uh, she was signing a a, a Funko Pop, and uh, and. <laughs> And and the quote that she was writing on it was, uh, "Those are the, the 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 biggest slowest bullets that I've ever seen." You know, it's like the fattest bullet. No, what is it? The fat the, the yeah the, the fattest slowest bullets that I have ever seen. Yeah, so, it was it was something like that. That that was a great scene. <laughs> and so she still gets you know people ask for that line when she's signing. So it's 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 cool that you know to be a part of, of something that really affects people. I think for me, like, with the only thing that really caught my eye with the animation change was probably, I think, with Robin's Reckoning. Because, like, the first part is, like, the animation was, like, amazingly beautiful and with telling the story. And then with the second part, I was, like, um, with, with some of, the, like, the... Yeah, I know. I know. It's just, like, yeah. it's just some of the stuff, like, it's not, like, horrible, but it's, like, I... Like, how Tony Zuko lo- looks, like, with being yep. all crazy eye, I'm, like... What happened here? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, and and uh, it's funny because those were Dick Sebast episodes, but I, um, I, I he had left by the time the editing was done, so I did the editing and called retakes on that, and the second one was just it was a nightmare to get them to uh, to do the the the, the retakes um, the over and over and over again, and just things never got done right. Um, there's one shot of of uh, a traveling shot on the on the on the pier where Robin is 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 like dragging a guy and 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 you've, you've seen like the, the the road animating and they they just did it in a really flat way and it looked really bad and I was trying to explain to them like the way that TMS did the title sequence where you do a flat painting with a grade a grade and then you just animate the road like bricks and planks and stuff and, and it's, it's it's like a, an overlay and you kind of you know and and they didn't understand how to do that and and i and they kept like the supervisor kept trying to get this right and i i write out a, a, a very specific graph of like this is how it's done this is what we want to see and what would happen was that the the machine overseas was not used to seeing this kind of animation done so the cameraman would look at these cells that had no ink and paint on it because it's like they're supposed to just be lines to look and he'd say they're not done and he'd send it back to the ink and paint department to paint over and 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 they kept trying to tell the guy no this is what we want and it never <laughs> it never sunk in so he'd retake it over and the guy's like what we might have to do this again and it was like because he kept doing it wrong 
And when then they finally did it, then they ended up putting texture on the board. It's like, no, no, it has to be a smooth grad gradation of, of just the color. Because, you know, and they and then also they put all the textures of the board in, and then it looked really wrong. So we, it was just, it was like seven or eight times until finally we got something that kind of worked. But it, it wasn't at all what I wanted and it, and it still kind of looked bad. But it was, it was the, the, the best of a bad lot we kind of just had to go with because it was one of those things where the studio just, just wasn't equipped to, to you know, figure that stuff out, you know, whereas like the ink and paint guys, uh, or the camera guys in, at TMS are, are cinematographers. They really understand what the animation is, what it's doing. They understand the tricks. They, they, they do all the effects. They, they figure this stuff out. Whereas in other countries and, you know, they're, they're just, you know, they're reading numbers and they're trying to just like, okay, this is the, this is where this cell goes. This is where this goes. This is how this is done. And they don't really like plus stuff. They're just kind of being told what to shoot. You know, ah, okay. and 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 so you know, it, it's it's um, it's it's the difference, you know, in between how, you know, what different, you know, and, and mind you, that's a skill as well. It's getting the focus right, reading the 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 the, the exposure sheets correctly, you know, the, the just the the mechanics of shooting uh, animation is very difficult. It's it's it, that is a skill. That really is a skill. So I'm not, I don't mean to detract from what those guys do, but but in Japan, they they actually give them more autonomy to like create stuff. So that's why the the, the, the bottom lit effects and stuff they they invent, you know. But they put the they're the ones that put the shadows on the screens where you had that shadow on on the corner in the Batman episodes where like you know you'd, you'd have like this gradation where stuff. You'd, a lot of times the cameraman would kind of go in and put a shadow to make that stuff like look cooler. Um, it, it just really plussed. It really plussed everything. It made it feel so noir. Yeah, I, I always like those those shots, like when we you just see like whether you see the the his silhouette with with the eyes or with or without the blue. It's just like, and then just emerging out of nowhere. It's just like it's just yeah, it's just amazing. Yeah, it was fun. It was a fun thing. I. Have, that's why I kind of like the second version where he doesn't have the highlight kind of works better for that kind of thing where Batman emerging from the shadows like the shadow it's it's really cool um so yeah yeah that's why I'm I'm often like I feel like I like the TMBA look the bet the best like where it's just a gray outline it, it just works better yeah yeah I mean it just I mean I I, I like the aspect of the original you know series where you know i mean come on i mean bruce was the guy that really kind of like outside of tim burton okay fine but but the idea of the graphic of batman as being black and not blue um you know traditionally batman was 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 blue it's always you know that that sort of electric blue and gray you know and and it's just like well there's no such thing as a blue bat you know that doesn't that doesn't make any sense in the world. Why would it be? Well, the reason it's blue is because it's dark. The reason it's blue is because it was the highlight and artists got lazy and they were using too much ink, taking too much time. It's not laziness, it's just time. They had to crank out. So it was originally a highlight, just a blue highlight on the rim of the, of the, of the cowl. And, and it eventually, you know, if you look at the early comics, he's, it's black and gray, it's black and gray, and then the blue starts to creep in. And it's like blue on the inside of the cape, and eventually it becomes like more of a color. And eventually it's like, there is no black anymore. They just stop, they just put the black shadow on the, on his mask. And, you know, which is why I kind of like the Adam West show, because they made that blue so dark that it feels black. It feels really, really dark. It, it, it's it's still it's still blue, it, and the highlight is blue when it when the light catches it. But mm -hmm. it's you know on a black and white TV, he just looks like he's wearing black and gray. But but it is it is a color, but it's it's pretty dark. And and so I think that was a cool way to to, to compromise and figure out this is the intent of what the comic is trying to portray. And and so Bruce kind of like was the first to kind of like let's just make it black, and then the highlight is blue, and that worked. That worked really well, but then uh, later on, it's like, why, why is it even blue? Let's just make it, you know, let's make it a, a, a gray. Let's make it a, a, a warm gray and kind of like it's really cool. 
this is the guy <laughs> you know and uh and then and Very then this, nice. this this is what he became you know <laughs> but not a, not a stitch of blue on him yeah then they went back to adding the blue again <laughs> and then he went to adding the blue again but that's okay yeah it's a darker shade of blue so yeah yeah it is it is it worked it worked it was fun it's a nice amalgam of all of them and also i like injustice league that his ears kind of got longer because it was that was fun we always liked doing the early stories of him you know the first batman you know with the longer ears and um and and that uh you know so i think when we and Bruce is like, well, why not? Just let's, it's, this is, we can do whatever we want with Justice League. Let's make it look different. So, yeah, because I know like people say that when it comes to his Justice look, it's just a precursor to Batman and Beyond. But when I see like those older comic book stories, I feel like this is just like a more callback to his original look with the longer ears, just being more um, modded with a more modern utility belt and such. Yeah. And the idea of the utility belt came from Glenn Murakami, actually, where he wanted it to be clear that that Bruce Wayne, or you know, that Batman was our, our sort of the, the Reed Richards uh, genius level genius. He was he's the the, the 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 brain behind the Justice League. So, you know, so we wanted to give his utility belt more of a high tech, almost Kirby esque quality to it. It's simple, streamlined. But just kind of more squared things off to kind of give it more of like this sort of high tech science fiction feel and there's just like a little hint of it it wasn't you know you don't go overboard but just a little hint of it just to suggest that because you know we didn't want to touch anything else we didn't want to make anything fancy with the bat we didn't want to do you know but it, but it was like that that bit with the belt kind of like sells the fact that he's a little bit more high tech than he was before yeah makes sense yeah i always like that whip as we get to like Justice League, there's a, I guess more of a Marvel feel with some of the characters and plot lines. Like that set up with Doctor Fate, Aquaman, Grundy, and Hawk Girl. Like you know, yeah, it's, it's pretty much like their version, like the Defenders. Yeah, yeah, you caught that. DC did too eventually, and they said, yeah, don't do that again. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, technically, kind of did with uh, with uh, Grundy resurrecting back, sort of. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, there was the thing with um, about that that was also it's 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 also a, a, a two-fold Marvel tribute in a way in that um, the way that the episode starts it, it I, I wasn't as familiar with Marvel two and one even though I have issues that, you know I used to buy you know I, I bought everything I bought DC but <laughs> but I but I did buy you know some Marvel here and there and um, and and Marvel two and one would do a thing where. They were two-part episodes or issues things where where the team ups would be like you'd start with one team up, there'd be a, a cliffhanger, and then the episode the next issue would focus on somebody else would be introduced, and it would be like that would be like the team up would be like a second thing, and so he wanted to do kind of like a a two-parter that wasn't really it was like a completely self-contained episode, but it would hand off into another episode that would relate to the first one, but it wasn't like 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 a movie it was sort of like a sequel thing as opposed to like a movie but you know and that was kind of what what that episode was supposed to to do which was kind of neat you know how that worked it wasn't it wasn't a regular two-parter in, in in that sense and it was funny because cartoon network after a while told us not to do the two-parters anymore and we snuck them in that way you know we still did continuity and we still did long long story arcs but they were self-contained stories now as opposed to like direct like you know part one part two part three so you know the whole thing is a big story arc you know as opposed to just like having a bunch of two-parters you know as yeah being, like, like a movie yeah because when i would see like the i think it was the second season of just see it i felt like i was like watching like a, a movie with those like two episodes like back to back well and that was the thing was like you know at that time not all tvs were hd and and, and they were moving into hd but we didn't have all the widescreen stuff yet and so we we asked them to do the, the thing letterboxed to run the first show and, and they kind of balked because a lot of people don't like that they think there's something wrong with their sets when they do that but they got it they 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 supported it they, they were like oh yeah yeah we get it we want this thing to have scope and feel like like it's epic okay well, let's do that and and fans kind of objected when they realized that the reality was that you know because at that point the square you know was more the rectangle was more of a square and in order to create the letterbox you had to cut off the top and bottom 
Mm. And so yeah. people thought, oh my gosh, they're cutting these things down. We're not seeing all the picture. And you're like, yeah, but you're not supposed to because we, we were planning it that way. We, we were designing it in a way that we could animate it one way. And then, you know, and, and then eventually, and this was like, uh, the standards changed for HD. So then the next season, it became that the standard was the, the widescreen. And, and then we're cutting off the sides for people who don't have widescreen TVs. So, and that was harder to compose. It's easier to compose something where you're cutting off the top and bottom, but then just to, to compose it in a way that if you cut off the edges, you know, you, you're, you're focusing in the center, but you really want to make sure that it's a good composition wide. So it, it was tricky. You know, we had these storyboards that had the different, you know, angles and the different way of, of, of working. So it was, uh, it was, it was fun. Yeah, because I remember like when Return of the Joker came out like, on DVD, it had that like, um, it was sort of like widescreen, but it had like the letter boxes. But right. But then when when the Blu-ray came out, it was like no more like widescreen boxes. It was just like uh, full screen entirely. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know. I don't know what what's up with that. Um, I, 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 I guess at that point the money. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know what the deal was. You know, but for the Blu-ray, why why they didn't. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm forgetting now if the Blu-ray included both versions, uh, or or if it was just the edited version, or it was the unedited version. I know. <laughs> no, I think the Blu-ray is just the uncut. I think now for the edit, it's just probably just the DVD, DVD or VHS tape. <laughs> right, right. Because yeah, yeah, the uncut is the way to go with that one. But there's some really good animation that was done uh, for the edited version for that you know change you know the, the Joker death scene difference there's some there's a reaction shots of Batgirl that are different that were added um, and and they were actually animated here hmm. it, what's funny about that is just to see how crazy the editing is how their scenes of punches it, it became a puzzle even though Bruce was really really ticked off that this happened and and the fact that it happened at that stage of of production where it was already done it was a finished film and then they went back and they they, they made you know oh this is too violent ah. <laughs> so so when when he went back in to to edit you know initially it was like this is you know something that was really upsetting but as he got into it it was more fun because it became a challenge and i would go down and see like look what we did here and you're watching a fight, and it was like, oh, okay, that's cool. You know, Terry punches a guy, and the guy falls off a, a cliff, and it, it was still really powerful and interesting. He's like, okay, did you see what we did? And I'm like, no. And you realize when you're looking through, he actually kicks a guy, or he punches a guy, but on the tail end, when the guy's falling off, it's actually a kick, and you can't tell. You can't tell in the cut that it's a foot and not a hand that's made the, the cut because he was like there was like this doo, 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 and, a, and a rotation and then a kick and then the guy falls off a cliff and the way that it's 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 just one punch and the guy falls off a cliff but you don't see all of and and, and they, it was incredibly well edited uh, it became this challenge to like cut out all the extra violence to make it work and it, it, they still it was it was incredible how it still played it still worked even with all that stuff removed um, and, and so, in a way, it was fun. Um, but unfortunately, because you'd have like seconds here removed, seconds there removed, things, it had to be rescored. So it had to go back, and, and, and the music, you know, the composer had to recompose the music and edit the music to fit the new action. Yeah, cause, yeah cause I've seen videos like where they compare like um, what's been cut, what's been cut, what, what's been altered, and especially with the me with the music with one or two scenes. It's just, though it feels like after, I think, I want to say after, um, I guess, Joker's actual de death in the flashback, I feel like after that, there wasn't too much to edit from, from the looks of things. Right, right. After that, it, 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 it got to be fairly straightforward, you know, because it was just a, a, a lot of the, the fight scenes and the death scenes in the beginning, because it's like there's that one Joker killing of, of that one guy. Um, and, uh, you know, and it was... Uh, with the, with the with the flag the, the bang flag going into him and i think they they had to alter how that worked yeah um, so because he does the whole sequence and he's walking around and there's this corpse behind him you know with this flag sticking in him and it's hilarious and dark and evil and scary and and they had to re-edit that so they had to redo that so it was it was 
it was a tough one. It was a tough one. That that was that was a um, bad management at the um, at the at the at the kids WB because they had nothing to do with it. They had nothing to do with the film, and 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 so they were really upset when they when they saw a screening of it and and. And they were like, "Well, we're not going to support this. This, this, this trash. This is terrible. Oh my gosh, this, this is horrible. The, the, the way you're, you're abusing this child, and I, uh, this is like, how, what are you thinking?" And and so this woman that was in charge of the of the network at that time, she was uh, a thorn in our side. She really wasn't supportive of the show, um, and she she threatened um, that they wouldn't get any support from the network. Um, no ads, nothing. If if we didn't uh, uh, change it. And so they went. All right, fine. They buckled. They changed the stuff, and and then they still didn't support it. They lied. They lied outright. There were no ads to support the DVD. So we 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 changed the the release date. We lost like like two months, and uh, and then you know or more, and then and then uh, and then they didn't support it anyway. So they lied. So it was it was. Um, it's like okay, all right, we get it. I get it. You're just uh, the flexing muscle. It's, you know, but it's okay. Yeah, that 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 prep person is not. Wow. Because I mean, I I remember seeing like um, when I was a kid, there's still like that big like uh, cardboard like um, case where they would have like the tape, the tapes and DVD. At least when I was a kid, yeah. At least. Yeah. Well, that's you know that's the studio. That they they were supporting it in the stores and stuff, but but without television ads on on the WB, you know. It, 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 you know, you, you want you want people to know it exists uh, on the network that likes running your show, you know, and and yeah, that's, they, that's they didn't they didn't they didn't really they didn't really do that. They didn't help us. So um, yeah, I don't remember much from TV shows. Like I know Kids A B weren't airing it too too much. Like maybe one, but I don't think I remember that. The, the most I knew about about for the movie was. I think it was just like um, those trailers they put in on um, the Pokemon movies, like before the movie come on. That's that's how I knew. That's, that's how right. I knew that's that. right. That's right. And that's that was the thing. Where it's like, yeah, the, the home, yeah, the home video people were, were promoting it, but but the actual, you know, WB kids, WB whatever, they weren't they weren't they weren't helping us at all. So you know, that and that's kind of when we know things are ending. You, you know, the writing's on the wall for the series when you know you're 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 not getting support. Um, so that wasn't a big surprise when that show ended, you know. So it's a shame because I would, I would like to see like what, what would like Dick Grayson or any other characters from from Batman like out. What would they be like in the future? Right, and that's what the sequel was kind of was going to kind of answer. Okay, where's 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 Dick Grayson now? What's going on with him? And and so he was going to kind of like team up with with Terry to figure out what's going on with the with the with the clone and find out what's going on with these clones it's, you know so it would have been it would have been really cool it would have been really cool but i'm glad we got epilogue out of it so you know everything happens for a reason uh, because I, I i i'm really grateful to, to have had the opportunity to do epilogue which was supposed to be our bookend you know in fact, I don't know if you realize, you know, we kind of that last shot of Batman flying across New Gotham, and he passes by the small you know, copter, the small, you know, police vehicle, the spinner, and it's like the, the blimp pilot, kind of what's that, you know? And it was like it was it was Kevin Conroy doing the same line he did for On Leather Wings, the first line he recorded for Batman. And that was the idea. We we're going to go out with the same line. Yeah, I, I yeah, I got that call back. It was like it's like how some people say like it ends how it began. Exactly. And he laughed when he saw that line in the script. He knew exactly what we were doing, and he got it. You know, it was it was really it was cool. Um, and then we got more episodes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, was that Kevin Conroy doing that line again for Epilogue? Yeah, it was absolutely, absolutely. Okay. No, he wouldn't do it any other way, you know, because it had to be him. Um, oh, it's, and, it's, and, and and he he knew immediately what he was doing, what 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 we were doing, and we didn't have to tell him. He saw the script and he laughed. He got it. It was really cool. 
Huh, cause I guess I guess I look back on that one because I could have sworn that what that was probably like someone else. It just just sounded like I don't know, it didn't sound like Kevin to me uh, at least from what I remember. It sounded like Michael Rosenbaum, like or someone young sounding. Yeah. But no, he was he was acting. He was doing the to his voice. So. Nice. I'm glad that we got something with the epilogue. We got to see like more like. I guess what was Superman reacting with uh, the garment, with through the Cadmus arc and everything, it's just... Yeah. It's cool, though, that it's like, you know, it, it all tied together eventually, which we, we had never intended. That was not our, you know, that's not how the series or everything started, you know. It started as a, as, as this is a, its own show. And then Superman was like, okay, this is its own show. And then at some point we're like, oh wait, we're, we're having to blend these now. And then, so the Superman and Batman show where they sort of interact with each other, sort of like, okay, so now they're blended. But we're still, we're not doing full on continuity. You know, we'd always do little bits of continuity within these shows, you know, the introduction of Darkseid and all of that stuff was sort of an arc. And then, and then the Apocalypse Now was, you know, that, that was leading up to that. And, uh, and then the brainwashing episode, the culmination of, of the dark side thing. Um, but it wasn't really like one story through line that we were doing. But then when we come to Justice League, it was like, oh, we're at some point. And then also the whole idea at the beginning of Justice League is that Superman you know, realizes that he has to rebuild people's trust. That's sort of implied in, in the opening, you know, the beginnings of Justice League where he he realizes that that's why he wants to like, oh, he wants to create world peace and destroy, you know, the nukes and all this stuff. It was like, there's an implication there of, of him trying to like rebuild trust. That, that's even alluded to in a speech to the UN. And then, um, you know, we got more and more continuity minded. And then at, at, at some point of the continent, the, 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 the Cadmus arc, we realized that um, Professor Hamilton uh, the last we heard of him on Superman was, I, you know, he, I thought he was my friend, but I don't know, you know, because he got threatened because of the whole, you know, the Supergirl thing. And and, and so he was spooked by Superman, uh, yeah. which which is really, which is really cool, because then that starts th that storyline. We're like, OK, so, uh, yeah, he's cloning Supergirl. OK, <laughs> Hamilton's not. <laughs> You know, he's not such a great guy. You know, it's such a same. I I liked him that back in in Superman, but but then like him doing like this, and yet, I mean, it would be interesting to see like yeah, you know, what becomes of him after all that. But oh well. Yeah, I mean, I think he's like, you know, to some degree, he just he's just frightened. You know, ultimately of Superman and and and, and Galateo is like. Yeah, he kind of fell in love with this girl that he created, but but it really is like she was sort of created as a defense against you know what if Superman went went rogue again? There's always this sort of motivation as to why these people you know feel justified in what they're doing, and the fact that eventually Amanda Waller uh, reforms and and becomes a, a, a good character for them, you know, it's it's kind of cool because you know because she kind of is you know she's not. She thinks she's helping the world. She's 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 defending the world, you know. Um, so she's not a villain. It's a, it's a very tricky thing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Cause like she just, I want to say she's like a, a an angel, but technically it's really the weapons that she's created. They're the ones that is essentially have gone re renegade because they have their own wants and desires. Right, right. And 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 again, after the Justice Lords. And, and all you know, and, and and you know, Superman getting brainwashed by Darkseid, it, it it people are justified in having fear of 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 the absolute power, you know. So um, the question in particular, you know, this poor this poor conspiracy-minded guy who sees you know connections and evil everywhere, um, <laughs> when he when he finds out that there are these you know Justice Lords in another dimension, then it's like it 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 it, it just really freaks him out. Yeah, that, that's that's just something good question because like he he researched all the time, but then after seeing that, it's like his whole world is unraveled. Yeah, yeah. No, it's so it's so cool. Uh, it, it, it's I I'm uh, I, I'd still pinching myself that I was I was a part of this uh, this world, um, and it's cool how it all comes together. You know, it, it, I, again, I have to repeat, we didn't know he was going to do that. People think that this was big 
giant plan all along that back in 90, you know, in 91, we were like thinking uh, uh, in the future and, oh, at some point we're going to do this. It's like, no, it wasn't like that. Um, it, it really wasn't. It, this is stuff that just sort of fell into place. And then at some point it, it, there was enough of a body of stuff for, for Dwayne McDuffie and James Tucker and Bruce and, and everybody to kind of like come together and kind of like figure out where, where the dots connect, kind of like question and where, where we can kind of like pull things from all the shows. And, and, and it was, uh, it, it, it was amazing. It was amazing how well it worked considering that continuity was the last thing in our minds in the old show. I was gonna say because it's it's probably quite something to be as, as part of something as big as big as this when it wasn't even the intention. But you guys, def I would say like to, to me, I, I didn't really question too much with the continuity, like if there was anything like left out or anything. Because watching through all of it as a kid, it's like uh, like everything seemed to fit into place. Like nothing seems like wondering like wait, what about this? But like you, you guys like seemed to got that it, squared away. Yeah, yeah, and it. it it's it, it's amazing it's amazing I'm, I'm, you know you, you grow up as a kid reading comic books and and knowing these characters and and getting the chance to work on them uh, as an adult is is like a, it's a dream it's a dream come true and and the fact that they've connected with uh, audiences and people grew up with it you know, we weren't even born when, when we were making Batman um, <laughs> And, and that you know, and I knew that Batman was going to live on forever because I was a big fan of old shows, you know, of old radio shows and old TV shows that I grew up with, you know, Johnny Quest and stuff. So I knew how important this stuff was going to be in the future. I just it, but it's still really gratifying that it's uh, that it's still it's still a thing, you know. Yeah, from my earliest memories were probably from watching with the anime show and. I had the Mask of Phantasm, like, at, I think after kindergarten, I would watch that, that movie almost every day, every day, even though, though I was I was scared, scared of, like, with some of the more graphic scenes in that movie. Wow, that's awesome. Well, yeah, because, I mean, the hospital scene is terrifying. Um, it, it's, 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 it's really, really, really powerful stuff. Yeah, that's one thing I'm offering, like, what exactly did you guys have in mind for him to do? Like, was it the laughing gas, or was it, did, did he, like, insert something did something to like uh, the guy's body or something because i he was the shadow looked like he was like digging in something like digging like a, a knife in i'm not sure i'm not sure because i know that he he's got the hand buzzer which sometimes you know he electrifies his you know, electrifies people but i think he might have had the toxin in the in the in a ring uh he might have i'm not sure exactly what 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 was the what was the catalyst there um I didn't board that scene, so I, you know I, I I didn't direct it, but um, okay. so you know I I I just remember it being very powerful and scary. Um, yeah, cause like when I saw the comic adaptation, I think I had that too as a kid. He was holding some kind of needle, so I was like, uh, I, well, I think there is a syringe he might be injecting the guy with the toxin, but it, it, it seems unnecessary because. He has the gas and he has, you know, again, he has various means. But I think we were trying to get away with stuff that we couldn't do in the series. So there could have been that also, because there's a, there's a, there are all sorts of rules. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the picture that Bruce drew of like all the rules that, that we're not allowed to do. Uh, you know, child endangerment and, and syringes and broken glass. And, and, and there's a lot of, of those that we violated on purpose on in Mask of the Phantasm because it's like, we, we're just like, okay, this is a movie now and we, we don't have BSP to deal with. Um, we don't have anybody cursing, you know, it's not, it's not, in, and, and the blood, they did actually tone down the blood because I think Kevin wanted more blood on Batman when he's fighting the Joker. Um, and and they just they let they let him just have like a little bit, and even the Joker has like like you know he, he's got yeah. a broken tooth and he gets some blood, but but even that would have been too much. Uh, they weren't really letting us do a lot of blood on 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 the Fox series or or any of them really. We we always had to tone down blood. Yeah, it was just different because like with my scene with the laughing guys, you should just like a quick little laugh, then just like you know, dead smile. But at least like with that um, Arthur Reeves, he was just like. He was just still laughing and laughing like nothing ever happened with him, like just dying with a smile. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that they're trying to cure him from from the thing. I don't know if did he did he actually die? 
Uh, not in the movie. He was just kept he's laughing. in the hospital, but but he's but he's just yeah, he's fighting it, so he's laughing uncontrollably. It's it's uh, it's great. It was so powerful. Oh my gosh, what a great performance! That was yeah. that was incredible. Yeah, in some ways, his laugh was, in some ways, was more terrifying than Mark Hamill's. <laughs> well, because it's a tortured, it's in pain, you know, yeah. um, and, and it's it's kind of like the laugh that uh, Return of the Joker that. Um, that was actually Andrea Romano doing the laugh that turns into a cry. Um, it, was, it was it was really really powerful stuff. Yeah, that's like it was a very unique version of the whole like um, Pagliacci. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yes, it's exactly it. Very operatic. It's just amazing how like with what you guys done like um, even to this day people still consider like these versions of the, of the characters that you guys have brought into life through animation like they're the most iconic overall even compared to like other more more modern interpretations i you know yeah i i guess so you know um it, it's it's nice just to be remembered as as one of them um but it is kind of it's very gratifying that so many people do consider that like the case that um that you get these movies that are closer to comic book adaptations and, and things that are like direct inspirations, you know, and that's that's and they're you know and they're really nice, well, you know, high quality films and you know, but these are the shows that like people really like call back on and, and then they 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 really remember. Um, it, it's uh, it's really really gratifying. I'm, I'm, I'll never get tired of hearing people going, "Oh, I grew up with your show. And, you, know, you made my childhood." It's it, it yeah it, it's 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 very gratifying to be a part of that. Um, you know, take that stuff lightly. Um, you know, take it for granted. You know, just I remember being a fan of stuff. You know, and and I know that if I wasn't involved in it, I would be a fan in it of it. So you know, it's like it's not just you know, it's it's really cool. It's really really cool. Very much. Well, I would say that'd be our time for today. Thank you again for to be a part, to be a part of, of t- for today's podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Thank you all for tuning to this podcast, everyone. If you want to see more, be sure to click on the thumbnails and at the bottom of the screen or in the links below. Also, be sure to like and subscribe to this channel for more content. This is BD Knight, signing off.